Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think it was a very good idea to have the cup of coffee or the biscuits before it starts. But can I say to you that as honorary president of the John McCormick Society, it's a great honor for me here tonight to wish Jeremy Mean, who has worked on this whole edition for a long, long time, and despite many problems, I am delighted to say that all of you are here tonight to wish him well. And the fact that Ward Marston is unable to travel, we wish him well too, because I believe it is going to be absolutely fantastic. So without any further ado, it is my pleasant duty to introduce Jeremy Mean. Thank you very much indeed. So, a good news, Lagos Accorder, Tafir Fralter Roy, Illa, and Shaw, Sea, so Halla Untak, a skull rig a coil in Lotlia, Augusta Soligam, Gamanic Ship Galer, Tanab, Us, and Okoid, Ahasuk Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, you're very, very welcome. Um, I'm Jeremy Meehan, I'm the guy who's got you into this mess. So happy to see you all here. Um, this is an evening that's been a long time coming, uh, rather a longer time than I anticipated it would be at the start, but thanks to all of your support, we are here, and it's wonderful to be able to celebrate the launch of the John McCormack Electric Edition this evening in the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. Uh, in doing this, I'd like to uh, acknowledged that the support for this project has come from all over the world. And I made a little list of the countries from which the subscribers are drawn. And it reads Australia, Austria, Canada, the UK and Ireland, France, Germany, Italy, the USA, and Tenerife. So I hope that whoever is listening in Tenerife has put plenty of Factor 20 on as well as uh, enjoying the sounds. Um, I'd like, uh, before we begin, to extend a particular thanks to Deborah Kelleher, who is the principal of the Royal Irish Academy here, and to um, Theresa Doyle and Morris and all of the staff for making us so welcome here and making this, this hall available to us. This, is the Catherine Brennan Hall. It was in former times known as the Dag Hall. Uh, it was built, I believe, um, more or less built by one of the original directors of the Royal Academy, a man named Thomas Dag. But its days are numbered because this hall, along with quite a lot of the other miscellaneous nooks and crannies at the back of this building, are, are shortly to be demolished, but be replaced with a magnificent structure which will greatly enhance the capacity of the Royal Irish Academy to continue its work. And that will incorporate, I'm told, a 350-seat concert hall, oh. which should be a marvellous addition to concert life in Dublin in general. So we wish them well with that, and, and sincere thanks for the use of the venue this evening. Now, I'd like to extend a particular welcome to, well, to you all, but to people who have crossed the briny ocean to be with us this evening. Um, and uh, without wishing to embarrass them, I'm going to thank uh, for coming from both the UK and the USA and Canada, in no particular order, John Ward, Keith Kurtzer, Doreen McFarlane, Alan Quinney and his nephew Nick, Edwin and Lydia Byland. And I hope I haven't forgotten anybody, but look, Maybe don't stand up, but maybe wave your arm just so that we can see where you all are. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> it's lovely to have you all here this evening. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, you know um, we're privileged to have you with us. Um, now, I, I know that, uh, as Donald has mentioned, our two principal guests of honour, unfortunately this evening, could not be with us. Um, Ward Marston and his partner and producer Scott Kessler 
Uh, Scott makes no secret of the fact that he has had serious illness over the past number of years. He's been battling with cancer and a number of weeks ago uh, he, he caught an infection which of course <coughs> when your immune system is perhaps not as strong as it might be the doctors immediately say look absolutely no travel particularly in places like airports where you'd be susceptible to any kind of infection. So they, they had to pull out but uh, the news from Scott has been Im improved since and we're, we're glad to hear that and we wish him very much uh, well for the future and I'll talk a little bit more about Scott and Ward as we go on. Um, but I'd also like to mention some others who had hoped to be with us here and who couldn't uh, come from overseas. So um, a warm word in, again in no particular order to uh, Ken Steenson in London um, Charlie and Rita Gerhold, Alfred Meehan King, uh, Donald Malcolmson, Michael Russell, uh, Michael Aspinall, one of our two uh, essay writers, and Mike Fitzpatrick uh, in the States. And I should mention in connection with Mike, the late Peter Dolan, who was a great McCormack scholar. Uh, Mike inherited Peter's archive and he has been very generous in sharing that material with us and some of it has gone into the box that you've received this evening. So thank you for that Mike. And to anybody else who would like to have been here and who couldn't, you're with us in spirit and you're, you're welcome in that sense. Um, I'd like to extend a particular word of thanks to all of the John McCormick Society of Ireland. Uh, I suppose this is not as such a John McCormick Society project, but I've said on various occasions that without the support of the John McCormick Society, I certainly would not have got this far. And I'm deeply indebted to everybody in the society, whether the committee members or the, the members who have subscribed to the, the set for their support. So in that sense, maybe it is a John McCormick <laughs> Society project. And I think most of the committee are here. So will you stand up committee, please, or former committee members of the society? <laughs> so come on, don't be shy. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what about a big bowl of ice for them there? Yes? Well done. Thank you very much. And uh, a big part of the family, if, if you like, of the McCormick Society is the actual family of C John Count McCormack um, who are always here insofar as they can be and we're delighted to have two members with us this evening, two granddaughters. We have Patricia Kelly and Tish Tinney. And <laughs> we, um, we, we had a very uh, warm message of goodwill from another member, our current, uh, our current uh, patron, David, who has inherited the title, and uh, David's mother, Sylvia, unfortunately couldn't be here this evening, but uh, we, we w would love uh, to pass our best wishes to Sylvia as well. But part of the reason, or maybe the main reason why David and his wife couldn't be here is that they have just had their second little daughter and I've just learned that her name is Alice. And Alice will be a little sister to their first daughter, who is probably nearly two now, I think, who was Lily. Yeah. Very appropriate name. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our best wishes go to all of them, and uh, we are absolutely delighted that the lineage is continuing. Now, I'm told that Patricia and Tish, you might be inveigled just to come up and say a quick couple of words. You're each assuring me that the other one will. Yeah. So why don't you both come up? Donald says that you'd like to. Welcome, welcome. There you go. Good evening. I'll be first because I'm the eldest. <laughs> so I just wanted to welcome you all and say how lovely it is to see so many people interested in our grandfather and to thank everybody who's done so much for, on his behalf particularly Keith here, who's come all the way from, from America, and all the committee, who have been splendid. I'm sorry I couldn't join you earlier last this today, but I just couldn't get here. But anyway, I'd like to wish everybody well, and thank you all very much, and say what a privilege it is to be here. And now I'm the youngest. 
And she said everything, so I have nothing left to say. <laughs> so I'd still also like to say that we're very glad to be here and very proud that you all remember our grandfather so well and are delighted, yeah. as we are, yeah. that this is happening. And thank you, Jeremy, for all the work you have put in. <laughs> and our best wishes to Mr. Marsden as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tish and Patricia. Um, I'd like to remember here, as we, we are all present this evening, in particular some people who began this journey with us five years ago and were very, very keen uh, McCormick scholars and fans, but who have sadly gone to their award in the, in the intervening time. And uh, in particular, John Kennedy, who is... Mo is, is perhaps more associated with things in the south of the country, but he was one of the mainsprings of this from the start. Uh, David Fitzgerald of Tralee, who sadly only died about three or four weeks ago, was a, one of the great collectors in this country and uh, was keenly looking forward to receiving this set. So it's, it's, it's a bittersweet thing to think that while he won't hear it on earth, hopefully he'll hear it in a better place, in, in, in even better sound than Ward Marston can produce, <laughs> if that's possible. Um, our, our dear supporter Ken Steenson in London is, is well, but very sadly his wife Vivian died just the week before last. And um, so we send our, our condolences to Ken and to his daughter. Um, Murish O'Keefe was another strong supporter in the South and a, and a friend of our Jim Ryan, who is here with us this evening. And um, Murish was one of those responsible for organizing one of the fundraising events for this project. And um, he has also gone the way of all flesh. And a name that may not be familiar to you, uh, but a lady named Helen Clare, who is a subscriber here and she was subscribed by a young friend of her family named Simon Robinson, who uh, works in the music industry in England. But Helen was very, very similar, had a very similar career and life to that of Dame Vera Lynn, who we all know for her famous wartime recordings and so on. And, and Helen blazed a very similar trail and recorded and had a most beautiful voice, but was a, a wonderful fan of John McCormack. And I was very happy in, in the latter weeks of her life to be able to send Simon uh, some of Helen's favourite recordings of the later part of John's career. And apparently she was able to hear them and enjoy them even though she was in failing health. And she died sadly just a few months ago at the age of 102. Oh. And Simon, in the months before she died, produced a CD of Helen's earlier recordings. And if you look for it online, you can find it. It's only a few euro. I, I would encourage you to investigate that. There's some wonderful singing on it. So um, when this uh, project first began, this idea of doing the electrics, one hope and aspiration I had was that the booklet going with the set would be a worthy companion to the work that I knew Ward Marston would do. And for that reason, I was keen that we would get contributions from people who are renowned in their field. And we were very lucky to be able to do that in having our two essay writers, Gordon Ledbetter and Michael Aspinall, um, each of whom has contributed an essay of about 14,000 words of exhaustively researched and meticulously uh, illustrated examples. Gordon focusing more on the on the life of John McCormack and how he fitted into the society of the time and the development of the recording industry and so on. And Michael Aspinall, who lives in Italy but is perhaps the most famous uh, living vocal teacher of bel canto, Michael does uh, an in-depth analysis of the recordings themselves. And Gordon also does some work on this. So from those two aspects alone, I think we have a publication which is a worthy companion of the, the records, at least I hope so. But 
Over and above that, we were also able to get permission to reprint uh, five essays from a very renowned publication uh, from the early 1940s, the Capuchin Annual. Now, you, a lot of you will remember the Capuchin Annual, and um, I had hoped that we'd have a member of the Capuchin Order here this evening. He had hoped to come along. Uh, I don't think he is here, Father Paul Murphy, no? Or any representative, no? Okay, well, we, we have a complimentary copy of the set to thank them for giving us permission to re... Um, basically, in 19, 1946-47, there was a special edition of the Capuchin Annual brought out which, in which was printed what was called a Symposium of Tributes to John McCormack who had died in 1945. And many of the leading lights and luminaries of the day were asked to contribute their recollections of McCormack. And there were maybe 15 or 20 uh, essays put into this. But I, I selected what I thought were, would be five interesting ones to reprint because there was a certain overlap, as you can imagine. Um, but we, we, we have reproduced those that were written by five people Vincent O'Brien, who was John McCormick's first voice teacher and more or less discovered him and conducted him in the Palestrina Choir and trained him for the Fesh. Edwin Schneider, who was his lifelong, career-long accompanist for many, many years. Gerald Moore, who was his accompanist at the very end of his career when Schneider had um, retired. Uh, Ernest Newman, who was probably the most famous music critic of his day and who wrote a shortish piece but which was used as the obituary for McCormick in the Sunday Times at the time and which has become a, a well-known tribute in itself. And last but not least, I, uh, we, we reused, in fact, Gordon has incorporated much of it in his essay, uh, the tribute written by the Cork concert pianist Charles Lynch who knew uh, John McCormick well, particularly at the end of his life, and whose tribute covers a fascinating period when, um, when John McCormick returned to the London Concert Hall for the first time. And he gives us a description of that very first concert in 1924 in the Queen's Hall, uh, which was a famous occasion and a, an uncertain occasion. But he also gives us a very... Um, metaphysical type of analysis of the impression that McCormick's voice live in performance made. So I think that those really add to the booklet and I'm thrilled to be able to include them here. Thank you to the Capuchin Order for permission to do that and uh, as I say we, the, a, a set will be on its way to the Capuchins. They've had quite a big year this year with the visit of the Pope and everything like that as well so that's marvellous. Um, the other part of producing the booklet, I suppose, was the, the booklet is about 166 pages long and it took quite intensive proofreading. So particularly towards the end of the, in the last few months, there were dozens of drafts of essays and things going between Italy and Dublin to myself down in Cork, uh, over to Scott Kessler in the United States, he had his own team of proofreaders over there and so there were numerous drafts going over and back um, because you had to have a certain uniformity of style, you had to make decisions about the use of, um, of European English or American English and uh, you know everything down to phraseology and so on and you can imagine that's tricky enough when you have one editor or proofreader working with an author but when there's so many people in the mix it's there's the potential for uh, all kinds of uh, upsets, but I'm delighted to say that the whole process was completely smooth. Everybody was a delight to work with, and we seem to have accomplished it without a crossword ever being spoken, and that's a tribute to all of those who were involved, particularly to the two essay writers, Gordon and Michael, because if you've ever written anything or produced anything or labored over something, you know just how close it is to your heart and the thought of somebody coming and tampering with it and uh, generally interfering can be rather disturbing. So we, we appreciate the patience and the forbearance of, of Michael and of Gordon and everybody else who was involved. Mm -hmm. So maybe they should get a, a bull of us for that. Um, 
Um, I want to also include in that a uh, gentleman called Takeshi Takahashi, who is the wonderful uh, typesetter and creator of these booklets that Ward Marston's company uses, have used for lots of their um, issues in the past. And Takeshi works away uh, in, in his own way, more behind the scenes than anything else. But the, the quality of his work is evident in, in the final product. So I hope that uh, we, I'm certainly very grateful to him for that. I'm sure we will all be. Now, um, the format of tonight really is I, I just wanted to get through those thank yous and introductions. The main feature of tonight will be this recorded presentation which Ward Marston has put together. Because he and Scott couldn't travel, he said, look, what can I do? So I said, if you felt like recording something and making it available to us, I'm sure we'd be delighted. Any of you who were present at the launch of the Odeon set uh, in 2014, five years ago now, will remember his talk and just how fascinating it was. How, who was here then? Let's see a show of hands. Yes? Oh, so the diehards are back again. <laughs> that's great. Well, that's, um, that's available online, actually, still, if anybody wants to see it. So Ward, I, I said, please don't go to any huge trouble. But being Ward Marston, he wasn't going to do it by halves. So he and his assistant, Mark Stiele, have uh, worked long and hard to produce this um, presentation, which I believe is almost an hour in length. And we're going to show that now in a minute. So that's the kind of the main body of the evening. I know that there are people here for whom that length may be awkward. And if you have to leave before it's over, please don't worry. Just slip out. We, are, I do, we do understand that people have other commitments and so on. But, <coughs> yep. OK. This is my current wife, Bridget. With me for many yeah, long you're years. Doing the I just wanted to say something that uh, nobody else will be aware of, and I suppose it's the the amount of effort that has gone into the preparation of what you see in those sets in front of you tonight. Derby has put in a labour of love for the past five years to this, so I think that nobody would realise the amount of work that went into it. Um, as well as that, uh, you know, most people who put that level of work into something end up with a PhD. So unlike those PhD thesis, I suppose, which end up um, on a shelf uh, and in a copy in a, a library somewhere and get looked at by, by very few people very infrequently, um, I think that this is at the extreme opposite end of the scale. So isn't it lovely to think that something that took the same amount of work as a thesis um, is going to be so much enjoyed by so many people? And I'm so proud of them. Oh, <laughs> That certainly wasn't on the script, but thank you, darling. Um, I could begin to try and, and outline just how much Bridget and our two boys have put up with me. Um, I leave that to the imagination. Uh, anyhow, what I'm going to say is because there were so many people who couldn't travel to be here or, you know, who were otherwise occupied, we are recording this event this evening. And my thanks to John Fay and Dave Dorgan here who are doing the honours. And they're going to make sure that we can see Ward and uh, Mark's presentation in just a couple of minutes. So um, I, I, it, it would be invidious of me to try and describe the labor that Ward has put into this, what the contents of your box there. This is really the end of a journey that Ward Marston began not five years ago, but 25 years ago. Because 25 years ago, he produced for Romophone, the company which is now defunct, the first two CDs of um, the, the, the acoustic John McCormick recordings, 1910-1911. And uh, when, that, when Romophone couldn't carry on, th those, uh, the rights to that were bought, if I'm correct, by Naxos. And they contracted Ward to finish all of that, all of the 1910 to 1924 material, which is the great period of McCormick, really. And so that is still available today. It's on 11 uh, single CDs on the Naxos label. Do get them if you can. They're only 
less than a tenner each. But then we came into the picture and we did the Odeon uh, 1906 to 1909 uh, with Ward, carrying on from that. And having done that, we said, you're not getting out of here now. There's no escape until you finish the whole thing. So that, that was when we began work on the electrics. But Ward has been there, it is 25 years since he began this. And that speaks volumes of his love for McCormack and his tenacity. And um, it's so wonderful that not only has he got the engineering skills and the musical skills, but also the, the, the connections in the world of collecting and the sheer good humour and goodness of heart and spirit to keep the thing going. Because there were times when we thought, we're never going to get there. Um, but we have got there, and so I was, th you know, I, I was thinking, how can I um, illustrate perhaps how we might feel about Ward and Scott and all of the, those involved in the production of the CDs? Uh, and I, I thought, well, you know, we could buy him a record or two, maybe. But then I thought, well, actually, I think he has some records. <laughs> so. I remember there, I was thinking one evening, and <coughs> it's my turn to embarrass you now, Bridget, that in, in Bridget's family in, in Bandon, in, in West Cork, where Bridget comes from, there's a kind of little in-house joke that they have. And it goes back a few years, quite a few years now, to when Bridget, having labored for quite a few years, was going to be bestowed with her PhD. Bridget has a PhD, you see. And uh, Bridget's PhD is in microbiology. So this was a great day, and the whole tribe went along to the college uh, to celebrate with Bridget. And of course, the party was led by Bridget's mom and dad, Eddie and Betty, happily still with us, down in Bandon. And a great day was had by all. And the following Sunday, we, we usually take a family trip out to visit the, the grandparents and the in-laws. And in we went, and up on the wall there, in glorious splendor, was a beautiful framed portrait of Bridget with her scroll and her cap and her gown uh, in pride of place. So that was lovely. A Couple of years later then, Bridget's younger brother, Eamon, was commissioned into the Navy. And once again, the whole family turned out, led by Eddie and Betty, and down to the naval base where Eamon, in his uniform with his sword, was presented with his commission by the Minister for Fish and Chips, isn't it? <laughs> Great day had by all. Following Sunday, out we went to Bandon to visit, and lo and behold, there up on the wall beside Bridget, beautiful framed portrait of Eamon in all his glory. So clearly, this was the, the sign of parental approval, that you had really made it when, when you appeared up there like that. And so it was that for their two younger twin brothers, a couple of years later, in their turn, uh, when Fergal joined the guards, and when John uh, graduated with his degree as an industrial chemist, and they had their respective ceremonies to which the whole family went, Bridget and Eamon were able to assure the boys well, lads, you know, this will get you on the wall. <laughs> and I think that, you know, you and I could very well say to Ward and Scott, Ward and Scott, if you're looking at this, and I hope you will be, this will get you <coughs> on the wall. <laughs> well, <clears throat> and you know... Um, You'll all know here that in, in Irish homesteads of a certain vintage, the wall in the parlour was dominated traditionally by a kind of Irish holy trinity of portraits, namely the Pope, John F. Kennedy, and Michael Collins. Yeah. Well, I think pretty clearly one of them has got to go, you know. <laughs> the competition is just too great. In fact, Donald McNally here is threatening to take down all three. <laughs> So I do hope that uh, Ward and Scott appreciate just how much this means to us. I believe that they have preserved in the best possible form for us part of our national heritage.
for, for us and for future generations. And we thank them for that from the bottom of our heart. So without further ado, I'm going to step down now. And um, I think our, our presentation is ready to be seen. Apparently, this I haven't seen this yet myself, so I'm looking forward to it. It takes just short of an hour. So as I say, if you can't stay, uh, don't worry if you have to leave in the middle. But thank you for the moment. Th there will be not very much more at the end of this. And there's more tea and coffee for later if anybody would like it. Gurmil Mahalo. to follow that, ladies and gents. Um, speaks for itself. Uh, I, I thank you very much again, John and Dave, and I mustn't forget to, to thank uh, Kevin and Martin Dwan for help in arranging the audiovisual here this evening as well. Now, while our two celebrity, two of our celebrity guests couldn't be with us, but have been wonderfully with us in this production, uh, our third celebrity guest is happily very much with us, and I think feeling a little bit emotional <laughs> now <laughs> after that. But uh, Doreen McFarlane, you're extremely welcome. Come up a second and we'll just... <laughs> now, it's only in the last hour that I've actually had the pleasure of meeting you, Doreen. Yes. We've been emailing and calling, but we hadn't seen Spoken each other. Spoken on the phone right. quite, quite a lot. And I was extremely excited at the prospect <laughs> that we could have a dual launch this evening of the box set and of your marvellous book. Thank you. Just to try and set the scene a little bit, um, the name of Paul Worth will be familiar to many McCormick collectors uh, because he, in, in uh, conjunction with um, Jim... Uh, Cartwright, Cartwright, thank you, mm -hmm. produced the definitive uh, discography. discography, I suppose, m well over 20 years ago now. Mm -hmm. A hugely scholarly work, and it's, it still sets the standard, I think, in many ways. But Paul was a lifelong McCormick scholar and was working on many other aspects of McCormick's life, um, the uh, biographical notes, the repertoire, and all kinds of other areas when he sadly fell ill and died of a brain tumour some years ago mm -hmm. now. And it looked for quite some time as if that body of work would remain unfinished. And there were talks about various people taking it on, but it was no mean undertaking. Uh, and so we are hugely fortunate that <laughs> Doreen came into our lives um, Doreen's late husband, I suppose, was more on my radar uh, mm -hmm. yeah. in McCormack terms. Michael McFarlane was, was, among other things, a fine baritone. And Michael made his lifelong study, uh, which was a hugely important contribution to McCormack studies. He, he made it his, his kind of hobby and pastime mm -hmm. in many ways to collect the scores of music which John McCormack is known to have performed but never recorded. And over the course of a lifetime, and, and I was very happy, as were certain other members of the McCormack Society, to be able to contribute a little bit towards Everybody that. Everybody put in a little bit. Yeah. Right. But, but this is, is um, a hugely important body of work and one deserving of recognition in its own right and one that deserves a good home and it deserves to be an active archive in the future. And Michael, in fact, didn't only collect this music, but he recorded himself no fewer than five CDs worth of it. Well, he made four he made of four. these. There are four. I'm not trying to sell this, I'm just telling you that there are 25 songs in each re re CD. How come? There are 25 songs in each CD 
And so there are 100, approximately 100, maybe not exactly. And every song was an Irish song that McCormick sang in concert but did not record. And Elizabeth O'Brien found one song and various people. There are so many people that were involved in this. Four CDs he made, and the fifth one he had prepared and was ready to record, but he was ill and couldn't record it. So I have them ready for whatever young singers are ready to come forward and perform them. And it doesn't have to be the same singer. It could be a number of Irish people. Um, or possibly people at Juilliard. I'm working on it. So that's my, one of my next projects, to get that recorded by somebody. And then we'll have all the songs that were Irish that he did not uh, record. Isn't that fascinating? And you know, it's, it's um, almost providential, the timing of this, oh. because uh, less than, well, I suppose an hour and a little bit ago, I had an email, as I was sitting at the desk out there, from one of our subscribers, in the UK, mm -hmm. a lady named uh, Louisa Harrison, mm -hmm. and she said uh, she was hoping that I could email, that I could post her set to her, because she said, my son is studying music in mm. St Andrews University in Fife in Scotland, and he has made a particular study of the vocal technique of John McCormick, mm -hmm. and she is going to make a birthday present to him of the set, and we hope he'll enjoy it. His name is Thomas. So That's keep wonderful. up. But, you know, I think sometimes we feel that the style of bel canto is something that belongs to the past and that it doesn't really speak to performers of the, of the present and of the future. But uh, what, how, how better can an archive like Michael's mm -hmm. be employed right. than in helping upcoming performers? Oh, we'll be and sure he gets it. Indeed, the society mm -hmm. is very instrumental in supporting that all of the mm -hmm. time as well. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I want to get off the stage Doreen, because Say a few words. you have brought a most wonderful uh, fruition to Paul Worth's work. It's now as much your work as Paul Worth's. Well, not and quite. But <laughs> I, can, I can see people uh, competing yeah. avidly with one another to get, get hold my of, autograph. Copy of your book this <laughs> evening. And so they're asking for my autograph. Oh, well, I, haven't I, signed I, autographs. I haven't signed autographs since I was singing in the opera. Uh -huh. And I liked it at the time, so thank you yeah. for asking. Yeah. Well, we'd love to hear a little bit Thank more you. I'll just say a few time. words. Uh, in case you're wondering why I'm weeping, <laughs> I cry every day for my husband a little bit, usually in but the morning. But today I kind of put it off, and uh, we, sang to get, we sang together for 25 years as a duet team. He was a baritone, and uh, one of, our, I guess our best number of all was Lover Come Back to Me. And I was about 110 pounds, and they would lift me up on the piano, and I would sit on the piano, and he would put his arm around me, and we'd sing Lover Come Back to Me. Oh, I, no, thank you. Maybe next year when we come back. Yes, i got to warm up a little. I've been talking too much. So that was Lover Come Back to Me. The other story is a, about Bantry Bay because he told me at, right at the beginning of the relationship, he said, I'm going to play a record for you. It was a, a, a cassette. And he said, I'm playing this singer, and if you don't, I'm not even going to tell you who it is. And if you don't like it, the marriage is off. <laughs> And that's the truth. I don't think he would have left me. But then later he said, the wives always say they love McCormick until after the wedding, at least. But I don't know how they couldn't love him. So I loved him as much, at least as my husband had, since he found a, a, a record of McCormick in the garbage can in the back behind his house and brought it home. And his mother said, you shouldn't take things out of the garbage, out of the trash. And he said, I'm going to play this. And that was the end of him. He loved McCormick for all his life. And uh, so he took me to Jack Heavenny. Jack Heavenny was very involved in helping me finish, uh, get more information than even Paul had. And that's another story. But Jack Heavenny in New Jersey uh, was living in the Bronx in New York when Michael and I had first got together. And Michael said, you've got to, that was when you had to hear the record because nobody had any other recordings. And the 78s, Jack had them. He was a big collector. And he said, we're going to hear some McCormick and I want you to hear these songs. And I was so tired, it was four o'clock in the morning when we arrived at Jack's. Jack didn't mind coming to the door and welcoming us in because we were gonna do McCormick. And so he, I was falling asleep on the couch and he kept saying, wake up, wake up, this is Bantry Bay. And he was right. And that was the first time I heard Bantry Bay. Now I just wanna say a few words now about Paul Worth and how this happened. Paul Worth, I have to tell you, because I've been working on this for seven years, you know, since he passed away in 2011, and 
that man was such a scholar. And he wasn't like a PhD. You're talking about PhDs here. He was a school teacher, and, but a, a, just a born academic. And everything I checked that he had done was correct. And I wasn't checking because I thought it wasn't correct, but we were just making sure we had everything. And so I have to tell you, it's good stuff, really good stuff. And I got together with the material that I got from Jack Kevney because Jack Kevney never wrote very much. But, and he's living in New Jersey now. He's, I think he's 81. And Jack Kevney went to the li We all have our gifts about McCormick. He went to the libraries in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and Washington, the Library of Congress. And every, every, at least two days a week, he was spent the whole day in the library. And all he did was McCormick. And so everything he had was McCormick. And so he had newspaper articles from, um, from all of these places. And they would talk, an upcoming concert is coming, so then we knew what dates the concerts were. And then they would tell what songs were going to be in the concert. The newspaper doesn't do that anymore. You know, the newspaper would never dream of doing that, especially for free. It would say he's going to sing the following program. So Jack and his wife drove twice, at least twice, eight, nine hours to get to my house with all the material in his trunk of his car. And we would sit down at eight o'clock in the morning. And we did this for a week, at least a week, maybe 10 days. And Jack and I would sit and go through the stuff. And we went through all of Jack's concert programs of McCormick and all of the newspaper articles. And we just kept plugging away and plugging away. And every once in a while, we'd come up with something that Paul Worth didn't know about. It wasn't that he missed it. He just didn't know because he didn't have access to this particular material. So isn't that, do you find that interesting? Yeah, yeah. So um, Jack came up twice. And his wife had a job. Her job was to remind us that we had to eat because we didn't care about food. We were doing John McCormick. And we used to you know, have our go round about things. So we had a lot of fun. And then I went to also to New Jersey twice. And the last time, Jack had to go into the hospital. He was ill. He's all right now. But I was left there. And I had the choice of going into New York City and you know, having fun and doing some things. And I thought, nope, I'm sitting right here, and I'm going to do it. So I feel good about what I did because I did it for us. I did it for myself, and I did it for all of you. And we, you know we don't do these things for money. We do these things for love. But now we have, now that's the last thing I'm going to say, what we have. If you've had a look at the book, John McCormick's memoirs that never were published. Now, he gave that material to L.A.G. Strong, and L.A.G. Strong wrote a very nice book. But John McCormick had a sense of humor. And that doesn't come out in the strong book, but it comes out in the memoirs. So you're going to find, my daughter, who's 40 years old, found herself laughing. She said, wow, this guy was great. I said, I told you. <laughs> so so um, the memoirs are in there. There's a beautiful chapter two written by John Ward, who's here. Where is he? Is he here? He's back there, so there. Oh, there he is. He's right behind somebody. J John, can you stand up and have let them? I, I want them to see you. This man right wrote the most beautiful <laughs> chapter about John McCormick's early career. So, uh, thank you, John. <laughs> we appreciate it. And 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 the book has. A, a, I wrote about three pages about the Irish songs from my husband's notes from his uh, from the CD notes because uh, he was supposed to write, but he kept putting it off and he didn't get it done. Okay, and it, but what you need to know about the book, and then there's a lot of other stuff in the book. Every book that was written that mentioned his name and all the newspaper articles, and every time he was on a, a film, even if it was 30 seconds long, it's listed in the book. So everything you want to know, but we couldn't get the book published because it was too big. It was over 700 pages. And so the rest of the book is in an internet, it's called Internet Archive, and it is in there at, for you for free, so all you have to do is go there and get it. You can read it every day if you want on your computer, or you can print it up. I know that a number of people are printing it up, so they have it as a companion to the book. What it is, the three things, the three most important things. 
a chronology of his life from birth to death of every concert, every opera, and also a few assorted things that he did. Um, so that chronology, I added a lot of stuff to it, kind of girl stuff, like parties he went to and, and the children's confirmations and baptisms and weddings that he attended and where he sang at various other things than just the regular concerts. Because, But you will see that no human being has ever done this, what he did. It's impossible. to. I'm a singer. I know it's impossible. And so he was an amazing generous person with his voice as well. Like he would sing opera and then he'd go and he'd do a whole opera and he's at a concert the next day and he'd go and sing at somebody's party or birthday or something. Very generous, always generous. Okay, so that's the chronology. Now that discography that Jeremy talked about was updated by Paul Worth till 2011. So we're talking about 1986, the discography was published. 2011, you know, that's quite a while, he was updating, updating, updating. So if you have that green book that he published, that's good, but you might find a few, some of these people have already called me and said, well, what about this, what about that? And I said, look again, it's all there. He just found out that it was a little bit different. It's pretty close, but he did a lot of work. So you've got the, you've got the chronology of his life, you've got the discography up to date, as far as we know. And um, then we have something that I love as a singer, and every voice teacher should have this. It's a repertoire list of every song that he is known to have sung. <coughs> Sometimes, like I said, even at a party. And it gives, and Paul Worth did this, I can't believe it. There are five pages just starting with A, just the letter A. <laughs> and the songs that he sang. And every person who wrote, the composer, the lyricist, the publisher, the date, and when John sang it. It's all there. And if you find something that isn't there, and you've got it, and you know it happened for sure, I can update that. So every couple of years, I'm planning to go in and add anything that we missed. So the world is going to find out about this, because my next job in life, among other things, is to try to get this book into every music library in the English-speaking world. Because this, they need to know, right? <laughs> Who needs to know it? I'm finished. Voice teachers, voice, how can you be a voice teacher and not know this stuff? You have to, you have to. So voice teachers need this and they can get repertoire for their students, you know? And, and, and singers need to know what a singer can do. And, and, and people who are, are saving, out saving the world need to know how somebody can use his own art that God gave him and give and give and give, because this was the greatest, wonderful man. And so I thank your grand, his granddaughters for being here today. We just want to look at you. We can't believe it. You're so lovely. And, and we thank God for John. And I believe that my husband and John and all those people that we loved before, my faith, I'm a minister, I'm a pastor, and my faith went way up when I began to realize that they're with us in a different way now, spiritually with us. So, so we know we're not alone here tonight. Thank you for being here for me. You made the most beautiful day of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Dorian. Wonderful, and, and thank you for making the long journey from Canada to be with us today. You, you put the icing on the cake. Now, for the last item of the evening, uh, I, need, I need just a few volunteers. So, um, oh yes, don't worry about that's your volunteer now. So thank you very much. That's very kind of you. And, uh, oh. I've nearly had it myself. Yeah, good man. Uh, Elizabeth O'Brien. Those Americans I have been going since the early morning. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're vol yeah, yes, thanks for volunteering. Come on up, yeah. Two. Yes. And uh, down the back of the hall there, there's a, whose hand is it? Gordon Ledbetter's hand is it's shooting up, yes. Gordon, yeah. you're volunteering. Thank you so much. And what's, the, what's that, sir? 
Ward Marston and Scott Kessler are volunteering at this very moment in, in Pennsylvania. Isn't that extraordinary? Interesting. Yeah. Not at all, and thank you for staying so long. This is, this is, the, this is the sort of grand finale. Now, you're very kind. And, and as you're making your way out, I'll remind everybody that there are still a few copies of the set available <laughs> at the bargain price of uh, one shilling change out of 100 euro. It's going to go up to the recommended retail price one of these days, I'm sure. Um, since I started this journey uh, seven years ago, with the, at the start of the audience, I suppose lots of people. Are we all right? Oh, everybody has helped in in so many ways, and we're so grateful. But um, I I could not be where I am today. We wouldn't be where we are today without the help of these characters here, who have Thank you. Thank who you have been you. stalwarts in so many ways. And, and I include our absent friends, Ward and Scott, in that. So just as a little personal gesture from myself and a tiny attempt at a thank you, I have a rather eclectic little mixture of things that I would like to pr present on your behalf. Uh, I must just go and get my flag here. So um, it's... Uh, it's difficult to know what to get Ward and Scott, but I thought that um, perhaps in those moments of repose when they're relaxing after all the hard work, uh, I know they like a cup of coffee and a cup of tea, and I thought perhaps um, we might, I might give them this, which I've had for a little while, so that when they're putting their, their cream or their milk in their tea or coffee, they can perhaps look at this and it has a nice tactile quality as well uh, and that it will remind them of the debt that we owe them. It's a little piece of uh, London silver. Um, the hallmark tells us that it was made in London in 1834 so it's just the end of the William IV period, just a couple of years before Queen Victoria came to the throne and um, I, I hope that they might like that just as a, as a little way of recording oh. that. <laughs> now our friend Donald has been the, uh, is the president. Thank you, sir. For life, is it? Oh, no, for next year. For all eternity. <laughs> but, and Donald is very, um, really the society would not really exist without you, Donald. You're kind, thank yeah. you. Uh, but Donal, Donal is, is very regular in turning up to stuff. And so I, I believe that there was certain consternation in the not too distant past when Donal didn't turn up at, at a meeting or a gathering. And people began to wonder because, you know, sometimes when you inquire about somebody who's, who usually turns up, you're told that, well, they, they've taken to the bed <laughs> or they've taken to the drink. <laughs> However, I'm reliably informed that when inquiries were made about Donal at that time, the news was much worse than that. He hadn't taken to the bed, he hadn't taken to the drink, but he had taken to the golf. <laughs> and he was last reported as proceeding with alacrity among the dunes of the southern Algarve. Yes, correct. Uh, being followed by a posse of much younger people trying yeah, to keep up. So, Donald, um, I've had this for a while, but I, I, think, th I think that it would be much, make much more sense for you to have it. You're a man who gets things done. Uh, you like to say that the world is divided into those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what, what happens. <laughs> well, you make things happen, and uh, this is a portrait of a, a golfer who has made things happen in the recent past. It's an autographed portrait of him. He's been uh, in the background for a while, but he suddenly has come back to the forefront. Oh, lovely. Oh, oh superb. Now, you know, it has to be.
be said, and it has been said, not by me, of course, <laughs> that on occasion, Donald, in your eagerness to make things happen, you're not, you don't always quite follow the rules and the procedures. <laughs> with, the, with the best of intentions, that, that you can bend the rules just a little bit. And you know something? I believe that Tiger Woods has bent a few rules in his life as well. <laughs> but they're different rules to the ones that you have bent. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, very, very <laughs> Every society in Ireland should have an Elizabeth O'Brien. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, if, if, if I tried to describe what you do in, in those back rooms, uh, bent over computers with lists and all kinds of unrewarding stuff that is so important because the world would collapse if it wasn't done, we'd be here a long time. Um, Elizabeth, I believe that you enjoy taking lunch uh, with friends and things like that. Oh. So there's a little place near here called the Shelburne, oh, and okay. we hope that you'll enjoy a, a meal with a friend. Oh, or you can use this in the spa as well, I'm told. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but this comes with, with um, this, this is not a total freebie, because th there's no such thing as a free launch, you know. <laughs> As I'm sure you all know, Elizabeth is the daughter-in-law of Vincent O'Brien. Elizabeth's late husband was Oliver. And um, Vincent O'Brien is one of the, if not the, unsung hero of music in Ireland. He was so central to so many things that, that grew from him or that he, he helped to set up music in RTE, the Palestrina Choir, all kinds of things, and bringing in musicians from abroad uh, composing, and one could go on and on. And I know that you have um, the most complete archive of memorabilia and of knowledge about Vincent's life, and I know that it is part of your intention to put some, some material together and maybe even to do a Dory McFarlane on it <laughs> and come up with a book. So when you take this to the spa and they put it in the machine, they'll be prompted to ask you, have you started that book yet again about, about Vincent O'Brien? Well, Thank you so much. <laughs> Last but not least, Gordon, do you like pizza? <laughs> You know, um, when I was talking earlier about the, the work that Gordon and Michael put into their essays, uh, and I was thinking about the sort of effort you have to put in to do research, and Doreen, you will know this just as well. And I think, well, do you know, if I'm trying to research something, I think I'm doing pretty well if I can find out what was published in last Thursday's Evening Herald. But then you read Gordon's essay, and you find him... Uh, giving a description of what was written about a John McCormack concert in the Tokyo Times of 1932. <laughs> well, you know, here is somebody who has really done his homework. And Gordon is far from a one-trick pony. He has a wide range of interests and accomplishments and has published books on all kinds of topics, knows most of what there is to know about things like architecture, uh, Irish history, um, landscaping, and music, of course, and lots more that I'm not even aware that you know about. So um, this is something which I've had for a little time uh, that I, I know Gordon um, will, it's much more apt that Gordon should have than I should. And I know you know what this is, Gordon, but I think people might be interested to hear just a little bit from you. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry about the conversation. <laughs> This is far from being a pizza. It is, in fact, one of the rarest records in the world. And I spent 40 years looking for it. It's a record he only made two by an Irish tenor called Barton McGuckin. And my particular interest in McGuckin arose from the fact that he began his career, uh, well, first of all, in uh, the cathedral in Belfast, and then he came down to sing in St. Patrick's and he joined a quartet 
called the Dublin Glee and Madrigal Union, in which my great uncle was the alto. And my uncle left about 36 volumes of memoirs, and there's quite a lot on Barton McGuckin, so I took particular interest. It's extraordinarily generous of uh, Jeremy to give me this. As I say, the search of 40 years comes to an end tonight. <laughs> A couple of other things I'd like to say uh, is that with regard to um, Michael Aspinall, and it's a great shame he can't be here tonight, but uh, in collaborating with Michael and so we did an overlap and so on, I did feel a bit like um, uh, John the Baptist, uh, not being fit to untie the shoelaces or tie the shoelaces of the great man because Michael Aspinall is one of the great writers of music and one of the great experts. So it was a great joy for me to work with them. I'm proud, I think, at the end of the project to say that I'm a, a friend of Jeremy's. He said that we and Michael and myself had showed tremendous patience. The man who really had the patience was Jeremy. You know, we were trying to meet, he had to, he had to meet deadlines and he had to crack the whip in order to get us to do it. Jeremy, you're a man who moved mountains and I must say, uh, I can only say I am astounded at what you have achieved. McCormick's discography is one of the great discographies in the history of sound recording. Without Jeremy, we would not have it. Yeah. So Jeremy. <laughs> Gordon, you are too kind, and, and I'm afraid I'd have to dispute that. <laughs> but it's, it's wonderful. One of the things I, I've enjoyed most about this project has been the collaborative nature of it and how so many people have had a part in it. And there's a little Irish proverb that says, Niñarca Carla Cela, which is basically many hands make light work, or if we all pull together, we can get it done. And I want to uh, finish just with a renewed thanks to Bridget and my two boys, Simon and Senan, for their <coughs> unstinting support in this. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> so that seems to wind things up, ladies and gents. Um, I think we still have a little time. We're, we're expected to be out by 10, but do feel free to have some more tea and coffee if you'd like. And thank you so much for coming. Slana Walia, August Kadesh, Slana.